Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming. I know it's a, a busy time after work. It's hard to find an ideal time for everybody, but um, since you're all working professionals, we try to accommodate as many as we can. Um, so thank you first for joining us. Um, as you know, this is a Brady MBA SIP session. It is brought to you by the Brady MBA admissions office. Um, we have a couple of us represented tonight and I'll introduce, all the, introduce ourselves in just a moment. But first of all, why you're here really is you're gonna, you're gonna hear from um, two of our professors who teach wildly popular electives in the MBA program. They both teach a similar subject, but different industries. Um, you're gonna hear a lot about, you know, you've heard a lot about business as a science and hands-on work within the Rady program. But what I'm trying to do tonight is for you to get beyond just what we do in, in the core classroom, but to really, really understand two industries that are obviously very strong in the San Diego area. So thank you very much for coming. Um, my name is Christina Cook. I'm an Associate Director of Admissions here. I deal primarily with the Flex Evening, excuse me, that's not my job anymore, the Flex Weekend Group. Um, my e email address and phone number is there if you wanted to jot it down. I'm happy to speak with anyone at any time, um, any questions they may have. My colleague who is with us tonight, her name is Sophia Palomino. She too is a, uh, Associate Director of Admissions. She manages the Flex Evening Group. So her information is also present. Please write it down. My, I hope you'll have questions and that this presentation will definitely spark. Um, before we get started, though, um, the intent of this SIP session really is to allow students and candidates to be able to see some of those people within, you know, that will be part of your Rady experience should you come but you may not have an opportunity to meet otherwise. Um, you know, you're gonna meet a lot of people in admissions office, maybe some student services up front, but you won't really have a chance to have a conversation with some of our most favorite professors. Um, this event will last approximately 45 minutes. Sometimes we go over, if you're able to, that's great. Um, it's a very interactive session. So um, our professors will be asking you questions, please engage. Um, I personally like to see people's faces and I'm sure most people do. So if you're able to come on, um, we'd appreciate that. If you have, well, actually, you hopefully you will have questions. So please feel free to answer those, ask them in the chat, or just, you know, the old fashioned way, um, raise your hand and let us know you want to be heard. So just briefly, I'm going to discuss the three MBA programs that we have here at Rady. We have two flex programs, one's an evening and one's a weekend. The evening meets twice a week, is about a two and a half year program. You're taking two classes a quarter. And um, those are typically on Tuesday, Thursday nights to start. And then you move into a, a different scenario this, the following year, and I'll explain that. The weekend meets Saturday, Sunday, every other weekend. Um, same number of credits. It is um, a little bit faster. You take three, three courses a quarter and you're out in two years. And then of course the full-time program is the traditional one where people leave their jobs, they go to school intensely for uh, basically six quarters. Our, our deadlines are, are, we still have some and we're certainly accepting applications now for the start of two, 2023. Um, flex, the flex deadlines, June 1st and July 15th, and then the full time has one more deadline on June 1st. With that said, however, um, if you were to submit today, we will review your file as soon as it is complete. So no, no need to really wait for a deadline. Um, and why Ray? So, you're here to learn about us. And so I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about the advantage. So we are heavy into, oh, I sent the wrong one there, sorry. Okay, so as you probably heard, we're really heavy into data, um, using data to make decisions, understanding how it can help you strategically plan. You will also learn a very strong set of technical skills as part of that. Um, and quite honestly, you can earn an MBA at other programs where you don't really feel so confident with your skill set, with, with um, the technical skill set. And, and those other programs do a great job in other aspects. But what you do here at Rady is you will leave feeling very confident about finance, accounting, and all the technical components of an MBA. Um, we believe in sort of the, the scientific approach to solving problems and answering questions. So we look at things from various angles. You'll be doing this in your classes with your professors. Um, and in order to find the best decision, the best plan to um, and we are also very proud to be ranked fourth in learning by Bloomberg Business Week, as well as fourth in entrepreneurship. And why are, you know, why, why do we have that fourth in learning? Because of the faculty. They are 100% responsible for this. 
not only are they very well versed in, in their fields in the industry, as you'll see this evening, um, they're known throughout the country with their research, but most of all, they're, they're really interested in making sure students um, learn the material and they, you know, and making sure learning outcomes are met. You will be able to get to know your professors if you take the time. It is not a super huge program. They will know you, you will know your classmates. Um, and, you know, that's, that's what we are here at Rady. We're we UC school, as you know, um, it has a nice reputation to it because it actually matters to us that we do a very good job. And without much ado, I'm going to briefly in, 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 introduce our two guests. Um, they will be talking tonight again, asking you questions and livening up our, our, our conversation tonight. So the first is Robert Bain. He is the Chief Commercial Officer for, and the founder of Park Solutions, Inc. Um, she was also Managing Director of the Bain Group. He has over 30 years of experience in pharmaceutical and healthcare industry, um, including prior experiences in executive vice president. I'm sorry, executive vice president of business development at Publicis Healthcare Communications Group and the co-founder of Legends QMP, which is, was eventually required, acquired by Publicis. Um, and we also have Magnus Dahlke. He has over 20 years of experience in healthcare technology, consumer electronics, and high tech. He is currently the Senior Director of Medication Dispensing International at BD, just a small company you may have heard of. Um, Prior to this, he was the director of marketing at Fixus Patient Care Solutions with NBD. Um, he was with Qualcomm for over five years as senior director of global licensing marketing and Eastman Kodak as the director of worldwide product marketing. He started his career with HP in um, Germany and then he eventually jumped the pond with HP and came to San Diego and never left, right? So with that said, I'm gonna open the floor. Um, this is just a slide, so at some point if you have any interest in giving us some feedback, please scan the QR code and let us know. I'm going to hand it over to um, Magnus and Robert now. Thank you. Great. Magnus, you want me to go or do you want to go? Why don't you get started, Robert? Uh, perfect. Well, well, first of all, thank you, Christina. You know, the fact that, uh, you know, it sounds like we must be paying you uh, to identify <laughs> us as your favorite professors. <laughs> so we really appreciate that. Um, but in, in, in truth, uh, honored to be here and I uh, wanted to say thank you uh, for the opportunity to talk to you guys. Um, you know, what uh, I was listening to uh, my background and, and it made me feel really old. But uh, the reality is, is I that, had to uh, cut a lot of it out, actually, for both of you. I could have gone on for like two or three more slides. Oh, That's why I was bundling my words. I'm like, how am I going to get this out in 45 minutes? No, it's great. It's like the the old adage where um, I, I was I was working and someone asked um you know, just give me the elevator speech. And, and by the time it was done, the other person looked at him and said, oh my gosh, that's a very tall building uh, because that just went on and on and on and on. And I think, I think the reality is, is that, um, you know, I, I, I think what Rady has done and, and, and they do very well is they, they find folks with experience and understanding, especially in the businesses and where they're at. I've been with Rady since uh, 2019, uh, as far as, as the instructor for, um, um, business development, or sorry, um, for biotechnology strategy and structure. Um, prior to that, I actually was one of the guest lecturers. And the, um, the premise of the class is, is not to help people understand and to start up a biotech company. And by the way, we use biotech very loosely. It's, it's a term that uh, was used, uh, you know, a few years ago, and it kind of captured everything. You know, I guess the, the, the real uh, terminology we would probably want to be using would be life sciences. But um, in this course, uh, it's not to, to define how to, to start a company and run it. It's basically understanding how to manage it and to work through the different parameters of it. And that's where I came in. I was uh, one of the guest lecturers uh, for the previous instructor for a few years. Um, and the focus there is really trying to understand, you know, what it is to be very effective in, in running a business. And obviously, that's why you're going through to get your MBA is to, you know, to have that business understanding and that focus. And, uh, but in, in the course that I teach, um, it's really defined around uh, understanding basically the life cycle of, of, a, of, a, of, a, of a company. And that's where you start looking at identifying a product. Uh, you then end up looking at, you know, what's the discovery, what's the proof of concept. Uh, and then as you go through these different stages within the course, my understanding and my focus has always been 
you know, you don't have to be the smartest person in the room, but you better have a lot of smart people in the room. And that's kind of what the focus in the course is. And the course is to bring these, these parameters within running a business, a key business. As, as Christina said, I've been in, involved in multiple businesses. I've started multiple businesses. I sold them. Um, and I've been focused on trying to find out what's the best opportunity and, and what's, the, you know, what's the opportunity overall to make that happen. But to do that, you can't be an expert in everything, um, which is going to bring me to my first question to all of you. Um, we pulled together uh, in one of the consultancy jobs I was doing a while back, pulled together a group of C, uh, CEOs uh, within the biotech uh, specialty pharma, pharma business. And we asked them, you know, what are the three lessons that you learned uh, with respect to, you know, starting your business, working in your business and, and, and supporting it? Anybody want to give a shout out on what, what those three might be? Come on, don't be shy. I'll, I'll, give, I'll give Magnus a shot. <laughs> okay. So the three really are based on one. Um, these guys felt that, and guys, I mean, women CEOs and, and men CEOs, I'm just using that phrasing, um, that they didn't um, raise enough money. And I think that's a key issue. And the second, the second issue that they, they really were concerned about was that they didn't protect their, their IP, their intellectual property, to make sure that their value into their organization was something that they could actually carry through and to, and to produce more value as they continue to build it out and to make it happen. And then the third was um, they didn't know when to partner. And I think what's important about these three aspects is that, um, which I think is the number one reason why many companies, you know, kind of have problems getting started and, and working through certain things is that if you guys are scientists or your business folks, you know, you, you can't know everything. You can't, you can't have an understanding of being an expert in all areas and all support. Um, and so I believe that the number one reason and the focus is, is that you need to know what you don't know. And if, if you understand that and you start surrounding yourself with the right people and the right understandings, then you will be very successful. Uh, that with about 15% of luck that also goes along with the equation. Um, and that's what, what this class does is that instead of me getting up in front of the lecture um, and sit there and, 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 and telling you everything I know about everything, I can tell you I'm an expert probably in around three or four of the subjects that, that we're gonna discuss throughout the course. But I also know areas like financing, legal, intellectual property, and even manufacturing. I have an understanding, I have a good experience, but I'm not an expert. And so I think what Rady brings to the course and what Rady brings to the program is allowing us to go ahead and bring those folks as guest lecturers and being able to talk about real time uh, things that are happening within the marketplace and, and how it's working. So. That's kind of been my focus. I know Magnus does the same. I'm, I'm not sure, Magnus, if you want to jump in and if you have anything that, you know, kind of differentiate within your, your class and then we can expand further. Unless, Christina, you got something else you want to focus on? Sure. Yeah, I think, I think Robert, I think we, I think our courses in a way uh, complement each other really, really well. Um, and I think we're, we bring different elements to the table, but I think around kind of creates a really nice, comprehensive, complete picture. So, Everyone, likewise, as Bob, uh, really excited to be here. Uh, really great to meet you. Uh, hopefully, it's an interesting, interesting session for you. Uh, before I dive in, I'd just be curious to see how many of you are actually in the life sciences or healthcare industry in some shape or form. If you could raise your hand or put it in the chat, I'm just curious how many of you are in the field or Michael is in the field. Great, we have one. Is my, Michael's the only one? And Joy, my, Tony, all right. We see a few more cameras coming on. Great. A couple of folks. All right. Sounds like some of you are in the, in Laura's in the field, uh, Charlie. Great. So it sounds like the number of you are in the field, and that's probably also why you decided to join the session tonight. Um, so as Christina said, I'm, I'm with a company called BD, one of the largest med tech companies in the world. Um, we have a pretty large presence here in San Diego as well. Uh, and uh, similar to, to Robert, I came into uh, teaching at Rady through a couple of circumstances and coincidences, but I'm really, really enjoying it. It's something I always wanted to do. 
Um, I teach uh, the uh, graduate course on, it's basically a course on the business of healthcare and life sciences. And I also teach, teach that in the undergrad program as well, a different, different flavor of that, of that course. And my course is really focused to provide a good overview in the first part of the course of what healthcare business as a whole is all about. What are, who are the key stakeholders? So we talk about patients, providers, payers, how do you get paid for all of this? There's a huge amount of money in healthcare. It's by the way, we spend here in the US, I don't know if everyone knows this, but we spend 20% of our GDP on healthcare, 20%. Just think about the number over $4 trillion. That's bigger than the economy of Germany, bigger than the economy of France. Uh, it's a huge amount of money that we spend on healthcare. Um, so it's a great place space to be because there are lots of jobs and lots of well-paying jobs if that's something you're thinking about. Um, but it's also a very complex industry. And so we talk about payers and then I talk about the pharma industry, um, which definitely has overlap, it stretches into life sciences and biotech. And then I also talk about the med tech industry. And so that's that's kind of the first part of the course, which lays a foundation. And you get to know a little bit about all the different aspects of healthcare and life sciences. And then the second part of the course a transition and focus on innovation. How do you improve this? How do you, do you improve healthcare and life sciences? How do you innovate? What are some approaches, methodologies that you use? Um, what are some what are some trends that are happening? What can you um, what can you learn from what other companies are doing, whether they're small or large? Um, and and then I spend one class meeting on what's happening internationally, uh, which. Healthcare, I think, is one of those industries that is very different across geographies or different countries versus other industries like the tech industry is very similar across geographies, but healthcare is very, very different. And so I spend some time also on looking at what's happening internationally because there are some definitely some things we can, I think we can learn here in the U.S. from that. So it's a really interesting course, covers both parts, and I think for uh, it's really interesting for students that are in the industry who, when you work in the industry, you oftentimes just see a small slice of this giant space uh, and you don't get, you're not rarely exposed to some of the other things uh, that are happening. And so one thing that the course provides, it gives people more context that you can take back into your jobs and you'll probably be more effective in your jobs and what you do and also maybe get a better feel for where you might want to go with your careers based on that. But it's also really useful and attractive for people who haven't worked in the industry at all, who maybe come from different backgrounds, different spaces, who want to enter the industry. And so they get a foundation, they get a feel for maybe this part is interesting to me, or maybe actually now that I'm learning something about it, I don't want to deal with this part at all. I would rather want to be in that part of the industry. And so it helps people with that, that as well. Um, so really, um, addresses kind of different uh, needs if you want. Um, trying to think, I think those are some, uh, that's basically, that's about what the course is is all about. And one thing that I think is really important that I'm trying to teach and convey in the course is, and something I learned coming from a different industry, I, I think Christina mentioned that I grew up in the tech industry and I transitioned into the healthcare and life science space about seven, eight years ago. The the, I think what's different in the space is you have to be very, very deliberate about what you do, what you invest in, how you choose what you invest in, uh, what problem you want to solve, what problem you take on. It's because this, it's so complex. You're dealing with many different stakeholders with different incentives, right. figuring out who pays for the new product, the new drug, the new therapy that you want to bring to market is really important. Uh, you can bring the greatest thing to market, but if no one pays for it, you're not going to be very successful. Um, so being, it's really important to be very deliberate, very thoughtful about what problem you're taking on, what really is the problem. Oftentimes, what do you think initially the problem is, isn't what turns out to be the real problem. Um, and then thinking about how you solve it, what's the economic value that you bring to the market, what other solutions are there? What other therapies are you competing against? Who's gonna pay for it, et cetera. So that's something I try to really communicate, get across, uh, teach in the course. And I use the biodesign methodology 
which I don't know if anyone has heard from that. It's developed by Stanford, but it's a it's a structured approach to uh, go through those steps in a methodical way, and it help, really helps you avoid making mistakes uh, as you want to develop or innovate in this space. So those are some of the things I cover. Um, Robert, I don't know if you have anything else to add. No, or I, otherwise, yeah. I'm curious to hear questions from the group here too. I just wanted to add one thing though, is that I, I totally agree with you in the sense that, you know, as you look at whatever your function is, for those of that are in life sciences and are, are working in the industry already, um, you know, you may be very, very, you may be the top top of the field in what you do. And, and but at the same time, you know, within healthcare, within life sciences, within all these areas, I, you know, I've worked for big pharma, I've worked for small pharma. As you look at things, it's not linear. You're not going from one portion of, of, of product development all the way through to creation, regulatory, you know, reimbursement to, to Magnus's part. If he, he's, he's absolutely correct. If you, you know, if you have the best product in the world, but no one's going to pay for it, you really don't have a product because you're not going to make anything to pay back everything that you've invested in. And, and, and these investments are huge, as you all know. Um, but the reality is, is that you, you got to figure out how to blend it together as you look at this thing not being linear in any way. Um, there are steps that need to be done before other steps can take place. But a lot of these things are happening at the same time. And if you're looking at life cycle management and bringing products back into the market after you know patent expiration, and you got to think about the patent early on, you got to think about the patent afterwards. People think that marketing comes afterwards, but if you're not thinking about the marketing and the sales and the valuation, when you're going for the investment side of it in the beginning, you're not, you're not gelling the whole process. And so, you know, what we try to teach, you know, I think both Magnus and I in both our classes is the fact that, you know, you've got to be able to understand everything that's happening within your organization. You may be an expert in one or two areas, but make sure you're surrounding yourself with those that aren't. And I think that's what's really unique and, and supportive of what we're trying to demonstrate and, and to drive home within these classes. One other thing within my class that, I, that we do is that we have a case study in every lecture. And that case study is related to that portion of the class, whether it's uh, manufacturing, whether it's intellectual property, whether it's, um, you know, licensing, uh, you know, going after the financing portion of it, or actually even looking at the separated management of the financing portion, which is another class. We have case studies and, and we can learn from those case studies and we create a, um, uh, an environment within the, um, within the class. Whereas when the, when the case study is being presented, teams are, are defined early in the beginning of the course. And when those teams are defined, they're, they're defined and they're given a case study. And within that case study, it's their job to present that case study to the rest of the class. Now, the entire class is responsible for reading that case study. Just because you're not assigned to it, you still need to read it. And it's not, it's not arduous. It's, 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 they're fun to read, actually. Um, and they present it, but they're not presenting it to the class. Everyone else in the class is either a board member, either an investor, or either there's some portion of the, of the press or, or some means that they need to communicate how they're getting that information and what does it mean to them based on the role who's ever presenting that case study defines for the rest of the class. So there's a lot of interaction, there's a lot of discussion. Not everyone is gonna agree on everything, but it really makes uh, kind of an understanding that, you know, just how other people really evaluate and look at things. And I think that's really important as you go through this process, as you, as you go for your MBA and you start focusing on these things is that, you know, what are these connections and what are these relationships are gonna take you? Because, you know, Further on down in, in your life, as you start, you know, creating opportunities and you start reconnecting with folks, relationships are everything. I'll tell you, you know, the, the, the key lesson you'll learn in business is that, you know, you don't want to, you know, you never want to really upset anybody. You know, you want to be honest, have integrity, and, and you always want to build relationships and make sure you build them so they're long lasting. You know, don't be frivolous in that. Just really be serious about how you do that and where you go, because you will be surprised 10 years from now, 15 years from now, and I can actually say even 20 years from now, that you will run into someone and because of the bond that you were able to create in, in your business and the integrity and the way you conducted and handled your business, that that may actually drive more business for you. So with that, I didn't mean to go too far off on a tangent, but uh, I, I agree. Does anybody want to you know, have any questions? Anybody have any comments? Looks like we got a question in the chat here from Grant. I can start with number one, and, I'll, and if you want, to, if you want to take it, I think the the interest rates are actually impacting 
uh, the investment. And right now, this is a very, very tough year for, um, for people to invest. I'm working with a, a company right now. It's an oncology company. It's in a, it's in a pretty crowded market, antibody, uh, uh, an ADC, antibody uh, um, uh, drug conjugates. And, um, you know, the, the, the feeling there, the, the, the attitude there is, is that everyone wants everything de-risked because everyone's too concerned about what these interest rates are doing. You guys hear that? A little bit of a, a weird sound. Weird or... camera. Weird camera. Right? I don't know. I don't know. But but I'm going to say something, right? So <laughs> when we have a question in the chat, I believe there are some folks on the phone that may not have access to that. So when a question comes through, I'm going to I'm going to just read it just so everyone knows what that was. And if you hadn't figured it out, the question was, how do you think rising interest rates are going to affect the biotech, healthcare, and life science industry? Who's answering that? Um, and I think Robert question. was uh, Robert was answering that that question, and I I fully agree with what what you said, Robert. I think right now it's getting much it's much tighter funding environment. Uh, a lot of funding. A couple of years ago, that was very very different. There was lots of money sloshing around in biotech, but that's changed dramatically. Um, and uh, Grant, to your second questions around um, what's my favorite thing about living in San Diego side. So I'm I'm from Germany originally. I moved here 23 years ago. My goal was to be here for two or three years and then go back to Germany. I had all intention to go back to Germany. I went to Walmart, bought the cheapest TV because those are things you can't take back because it's different different power outlets and all that. Uh, well, and here I am 23 years later, and uh, I always say it was palm trees, sunshine, beach. Uh, and then I met my wife. She doesn't like it when I tell it in that order, but um, uh, it's kind of what happens. So it's a, it's a it's a great place. I think. The weather, 75 and sunny, is uh, is a, is a huge benefit. It's a it's a pretty relaxed place to live. Um, it's good work life, a kind of good quality, really good quality of life, I would say as well. Um, what I like about San Diego are it has lots of different neighborhoods and different areas that have a different feel and a different character to them. You have the beaches, or you know, it's all flip flops and shorts and surfers. You have La Jolla that feels like a Mediterranean village. You have, uh, you know, Del Mar that feels a little bit more upscale. And you have Ocean Beach that's on the opposite end of that. It's very, very chill, relaxed. You feel like you're in the 60s still. You have downtown. You have, you have, you know, Mexico is 40 minutes away, and you can have dinner in Tijuana if you want. And as uh, so you have so much variety, and there's so many different neighborhoods, and I think that makes it and a lot of diversity and people from all over the world, and it's it kind of makes it enriching and fun to me. I don't know if Robert, Christina, yeah. if you have anything to add. Yeah, sorry. I actually had a like an issue here, and I, I, I've got to fix. But um, uh, yeah, I also I think the, the the key about San Diego is the weather. There's no question about it. And uh, I came from Northern Michigan, and you know I came out here, uh, didn't have a job or anything. I turned around, quit my job back at back in Michigan, just came out and I got a job at UCSD. Thank God, and did research for about five years, which kind of reshaped my whole my whole way of doing things and thinking on things. But I totally agree. Um, also, we have a question from Deepak. Um, you know, it, it's structure perspective around um, uh, the origin. Uh, notice with uh, an Eastern Asian, I think it's all tied around. Are we going to see generics? Uh, how is generics going to influence the U.S. and um, is it going to be similar to the ITAC? Uh, for IT and other, and other aspects around it, and is, am I am I kind of paraphrasing your your question correctly? Um, and I'm not sure if you have a mic. Okay, perfect. So um, that's a great question. That's a great question, and I'll tell you what. Um, part of the answer to that is really tied to kind of COVID. I think COVID kind of opened everyone's eyes when we started realizing where everything's being sourced from. I definitely believe that we're gonna see much more impact within uh, generic and um, support and services being more defined within the US or maybe within other countries outside of India and, and like Vietnam and, and some of the Asia countries where a lot of the sourcing is taking place in those countries. Um, and I think the uniqueness there is probably gonna be shifted more towards from the small molecule to the larger molecule uh, in which um, we're looking at the um, uh, the bioequivalents and, and other products that are being created, which have been defined and, and pretty much structured here in the U.S. in the first place. So 
I, I think there will be some shifting. I think that, um, you know, uh, ironically enough, you get people like Mark Cuban and other folks that are creating their own companies where they're looking at developing products and bringing them into the market. So you're going to have even a greater twist with respect, and this is just my opinion, but you may see greater twists versus generics versus branded generics and other opportunities. And then when you start looking into products that are much more personalized and personalized medicine, uh, you know, with um, the, the, the marking and everything else and, and trying to find, you know, more individualized medicine towards, towards patients, that's going to be another shift too. So the sourcing for the larger overall huge mass of you know products are now going to be coming at some point going to be coming much more you know patient focused patient population focused as well that's my opinion i don't know if mangus have you got any comments on that or if you want to add anything yeah no, i think you, you covered a lot of things maybe the one thing i would add is uh what you often see with generics is, is a huge problem are drug shortages where for many generics there are only one or two or three companies in the world that manufacture them and if they get to shut down by the FDA or have some other issue, you take a good chunk of the supply out of the market and there's immediately a shortage. Um, and those are typically uh, very common drugs that are used for, for conditions that many, many patients have and many patients need. And if there are these shortages, it creates a lot of issues in healthcare where all of a sudden hospitals, pharmacists, doctors have to substitute drugs, um, dial patients in again, et cetera, dose them correctly. So they're very disruptive uh, and there are efforts going on to, to address those. They're actually a group of large hospital chains in the US have come together and they said that we're gonna start our own generic drug manufacturing to avoid these, um, these drug shortages. So that's maybe another dynamic that may um, may come into the mix here um, around where drugs are manufactured, especially generics. Okay. Question, how important would you say is collaboration between academia and industry in advancing biotech research and development? And you guys are you guys are coming out with some really great questions. I, I didn't know we'd have to study for this one, but um, <laughs> Now, I actually think, I think, I don't know, I don't know, Magnus, you want me to, I was just going to jump in. Yeah, I should probably be more polite. Um, I, I would, I would say it, it's, it's huge. Um, you know, one of the, one of the key things about, you know, coming from pharma and coming from that space and working in, in multiple different areas within that space, I think what's unique about, um, about uh, the U.S. and, and, and the EU and, and other areas, but mostly driven by, by the U.S. is the ability to be, competitive and the ability to, to be innovative and create new products and new and new understanding. You know, with the larger, you know, blockbuster products now that are shrinking and everyone's now focusing, like I said earlier, you know, more trying to be more specific around individualizing medicine to a certain degree, but at the same time still taking care of large patient populations. You know, um, we have to be very creative because even though we may be a very wealthy uh, country, as Magnus pointed out, the truth is, is that there's a lot of companies that are, are countries that are poor, and we still have to figure out a solution across the board. Like with COVID, if, if as an example, you know, it's not like you can just treat the U.S. with travel and everything else going on across the, you know, globally, you know, you have to really treat the world to, to make sure that we can actually control, you know, this type of um, pandemic or whether it's a disease or, or anything else there. And to do that, you need to be you need to be innovative. And I think it's very important that there's collaboration going on between academia and industry, because I think in many cases, as you look at what happens within um, some of these major pharma companies, you know, they're kind of shutting down their farms, you know, where they're looking at their new products to be developed and created from. And, and as you may or may not know, out of 10,000 products that uh, are exposed, roughly you know, three come to market. And when you look at the investment and the amount of time, energy and, and, and resources that go into something like that, you know, you want to make sure you got your best minds, your smartest people coming up with these ideas and creating these types of solutions. And so I think it's, I think it's critical. I, when, I, when I was at Bristol Myers, I, we, uh, we worked closely with Scripps. Um, even though I was working back and forth on the East Coast quite frequently, we knew that there were certain arms that could be very effective. UCSD, we worked with uh, UCSD in, in the sense that trying to find certain aspects that we could use to go ahead and, and expand our, our, our understanding. So I, I'll, I'll throw it back to you and Magnus to see if you have anything that, especially on the technology, it's important as well. So 
Yeah, I, th I think what's maybe the one thing I'd add is uh, what's interesting, what I think is has shifted over the last five or 10 years is where in general, uh, academia produces a lot of great people with great ideas um, that they developed during their time in academia. And they then start a business and eventually leave academia to focus on that business and becomes a startup and a biotech and grows to a certain extent. And those startups become the pipeline for the larger pharma companies. And I think what's, Bob, I'm curious to see if you would agree with this, over the last maybe 10, 20 years, there's been a shift where the larger, the large, really large pharma companies are more and more relying on acquisitions rather than in-house development. They're, they're certainly still doing in-house development, but they're realizing that maybe they're not always the best at uh, deciding what to bet their their chips on, and they rather watch some of these startups and then uh, acquire them based on where they want to focus and um, take something that that is has made it to a certain milestone in the development cycle. So I think there's kind of this journey from academia to startup to biotech to to then uh, being becoming part of a larger larger pharma company. I, Bob, I don't know if you would agree with that or. No, I, I totally agree with you. I, and I think I think that's interesting too is the fact that um, a lot of times when academia comes into into the business aspect, you know, they they have very strong understanding of, of of what needs to be done and how it needs to be done. But you also still need to make sure you bring in the right business folks as well. Um, just because you you may be really smart in, in, in developing something, uh, it's not necessarily a, a, an area of intelligence. It's really an area of, of understanding and experience and. Um, I don't think you can ever go wrong by by hiring if, if if you're in a position to do that to hire the right amount of experience, the right amount of relationships to make all this happen. And academia has a has a tremendous you know it's a tremendous pool of of uh, intelligence, and I think that yeah, needs to be tapped. And you know just like artificial intelligence as well too. You know as that comes into the market and we start realizing there's better and smarter ways to, to find new products, repurpose products, and to, and to generate new opportunities. Um, you still need the folks to really understand how it works and, and how, how to make it you know, actually something that's going to be profitable. Um, hope that answers your question. There's a question from Laura around capst a capstone project. Um, but I'll read it. My recollection is that the conventional MBA programs incorporate things like a capstone project and engaged alumni network. Could any of the panelists speak to the rate experience with respect to that? That would be a question that I can speak to, um, and I can certainly refer you to others as well. But um, you know, MBA programs have a have a have a goal, and that is to make sure that their students are. Um, learning the core foundation and the functional, the basic functional areas of a business. So they're not necessarily going to, you're not necessarily going to be an expert in any one particular area, but like Robert said, you're going to know enough of every area to know I need help or I don't need help. In addition, when you do start to focus a little bit more, you can't, you do have choices for your electives, you can become more knowledgeable in specific areas. Um, in terms of capstone projects and alumni, of course, um, an MBA without a sort of a Matt, you know, a capstone project would, in my opinion, you know, would need to get one soon. But um, of course, Rady has that. We have two options. One's called the Rady Action Project, which is uh, essentially a lab to market experience, an entrepreneurship experience um, that's offered in the second year. And then another option, which is the consulting um, arm of that, which where you would actually just choose to be a consultant for a company that hires us to solve a problem for them. Um, the first, the Rady Action Program project is where students bring an idea, work in a group, and vet the, vet the idea to see if it's actually feasible. Um, and of course, alumni, you know, alumni are always part of our experience. We bring them in as many times as we can. Most of them are incredibly useful and, and are very willing to help out. We, we had a, a, group, a, a live event a couple of weeks ago. We brought in some wonderful alums. I mean, they provide insight that, you know, not professors can't necessarily provide, we can't provide. And um, we're very lucky to have such, you know, such engaged in them, like particularly in the San Diego market um, that are willing and, and really flexible to be able to come in and help us. Does that answer your question, Laura? Okay, I'm gonna say yes. Okay, great. Um, the other question from um, Mai is, 
and this is obviously directed not to me. <laughs> um, in your opinion, what's the difference between the Boston area biotech ecosystem and the San Diego Silicon Valley? Um, is there more specific scientific area? Is there any scientific area that is more suitable to do business in a certain location? Well, I'm just smiling because uh, we're corporate out of Boston and I live in San Diego and I started the company. I brought in some partners and uh, it's kind of ironic when I, uh, when I first started working here, I, I realized, it was back to the first question, you know, what do you love most about San Diego? I realized that I'm going to work where I live and not live where I work. Um, and on that basis, um, that's the reason why I've, I've done so many different things is because you get to a certain level and then they tell you you have to relocate. Uh, and so that's why I started thinking, well, if I create the business, then I can stay where I want to stay and do what I want to do, and which is, you know, kind of arrogant and gutsy, but I was scared to death every time I did it. So that's that's the truth behind it. But the reality is, is that um, I don't think there's that much difference. I think there's there's certain institutions that that provide certain uh, intelligence or certain uh, understandings that may be a little bit more specific to that geography. I mean, let's face it, Boston has got I think it has more. Um, more schools than any other area within the entire United States and possibly even in the world, considering all the different um, uh, schools that they have there. Um, my partners, uh, uh, MIT, uh, Harvard is the other one, Columbia is the third one. And, and you know, and I just say, you guys have this huge pedigree of schools behind you, but, you know, you're shoveling snow and I'm going to the beach at five o'clock. So, I think that's probably the biggest, biggest benefit between the two areas in, in what's happening. I think the reality, though, is, is that um, if you have a good idea and you got the right people behind you and you're focusing on, on what you're trying to create and what you're trying to develop, um, there's going to be some collaboration. But as I said earlier, you know, you, you, you've got to look at geography, not just even in your state or in your area, in your country. You got to look at it as a worldwide because the world's much smaller now. And if you're trying to create something that's going to benefit, you know, more people, you got to look outside of just what we do here. And I think that's where you, you see that collaboration. I know like, uh, you know, even other countries um, can be very impactful. And I know Angus comes from Germany and he has, he probably has an opinion on this too, but that's just my opinion. Yeah, I would, I would agree. I, would, I think geography or location has become less and less important since COVID, since you know working remotely has become so so commonplace. It's so accepted. We've all learned that it works, right? Before COVID, I think many many of us, including myself, had doubts whether permanent remote work could work, but it, it does work very well. Um, you know, I can I can share with you at BD, we're continuing to grow significantly here in San Diego. We're actually moving a good chunk of our life sciences business to San Diego right now. We're building two large, amazing buildings, uh, just two exits away from the UCSD campus. And they do have surfboard storage, very important when you build a building here in San Diego. Um, but definitely, I think we have a very vibrant ecosystem in San Diego. And it's not just one thing. I think there's a core strength around biology, um, really the, the bio, biosciences here. But you have a pretty robust um, medtech ecosystem as well. You have companies like ResMed that are headquartered here in San Diego now. You have Dexcom, super successful in the diabetes space. You have BD, of course, and a number of others. Illumina. Illumina, right. I can, 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 can do anything without mentioning Illumina. My wife works there, but they're obviously huge in the genomic space. And, and it's interesting, these larger companies, they spawn a number of startups and smaller companies, especially Illumina. You have now dozens of genomics startups and businesses of all sizes here in San Diego that are founded by former Illumina employees. So it kind of creates this little snowball effect as well. Yeah, I don't totally think that's hopeful, but... <clears throat> One other thing too, though, is that if you are specializing in certain areas and there are, you know, there are certain areas like, you know, you know that, that actually have, you know, specialization um, expertise and stuff and, you know, uh, definitely look into that. Uh, you know, you can't just say that I'm, I'm going to, you know, go ahead and compete against um, uh, certain markets that where they're already established, and and that's the kind of like the the folks that people look to that you know to see is this the right thing to do in this therapeutic area. Uh, on the other, like the whole New Jersey corridor, the you know that whole area with with pharma, and then you start looking at you know where Amgen and Genentech, you know it's like the West Coast is more on the biologicals. Now people are shifting the biologicals to the East and vice versa. 
you know, but there's, you know, if, if you have a specific um, interest or a, or a specialty that you're, that is actually uh, has some geography presence, then, you know, you should, you should look at that, that it's, it's, you can't necessarily transfer everything over, even though the world's much smaller, as we said earlier, and, and, and then there's a lot more open communications, um, uh, communication, it, it's just, it's just something that you should consider. Hopefully you're asking, you're answering your question there. Those of you, it is past 615. If you need to sign off, I fully understand. You will not hurt my feelings. Um, I'm sure no one's feelings will be hurt. But if you can stay, it sounds like we have an awesome question that these the two folks will answer for us. So the question is, um, would you like to share your experiences about if you ever felt that the pharma industry is, has darker shades than you thought or if you would have thought? Um, in recent times in America, the opioid crisis, the fentanyl crisis took place under the AGS of McKinsey, which helped um, allegedly peddle and sell drugs in the market. This, does this nexus show that there's a very hard-nosed commercial marketing element in the industry um, that in the industry realized it had? Um, does, the, does the DOJ charge huge, does the DOJ charge us huge fines for more um, unscrupulous firms? And it's a big topic. So um, question there is, I guess, did you realize that it had a darker, you know, it had a dark side? Yeah, maybe maybe Deepak, I'll, I'll take a shot at your question. It's a big question. And, um, uh, and I'll, uh, I'll address both, both topics. Um, uh, I think one, you know, I deal in my daily life, I deal with drugs and pharmacists all the time because I'm in the medication management side of the business. And relative to generics, there's a great book um, uh, about the generics industry in India. You mentioned earlier, Deepak, a lot of drugs are manufactured in India or China. And that definitely has a, has a darker side to it where um, sometimes manufacturing standards aren't quite up to the standard that the FDA would expect it to be at, for example. There are all kinds of horror stories around that. Um, but I think one of the things that hits home with me the most, if you take the same drug that we get from a generics company in India here in the US, and then you go to a developing uh, third world country where they get that same drug, maybe from the same company, it's not the same drug. It's kind of a, a lower grade version of that same drug. So if you ask, you know, doctors without frontiers, when they go to an African country and uh, treat patients, they prescribe a drug and they realize it doesn't work. And they're scratching their head and what they end up doing, they're prescribing three, five, 10 times the normal dose that here might kill someone. You would never do that, but you have to prescribe these high doses so that you get a therapeutic effect out of this lower grade, lower grade drug. So if you're asking for darker sides, that would be one uh, that comes to mind. And around the opioid crisis, of course, it's a huge problem. Uh, we had over 100,000 people die in the US in 2021 alone from drug overdoses. In my field, we make devices that keep drugs safe in the healthcare environment, and especially opioids. There's a huge amount of investment in technology that tracks every single pill, every single vial of an opioid. Um, pharmacists very quickly lose their jobs when they lose those drugs. Um, I was in the Middle East uh, a couple of years ago talking with a pharmacist there. It's so extreme if you lose a drug as a pharmacist, um, uh, an opioid, you can quickly lose your hand, uh, for example, this a uh, little, little different there, but uh, very, very serious, a lot of investment to counteract the opioid crisis. But of course, the root cause of that is what Purdue Pharma and others and others did um, a while ago. Yeah, Bob, I, 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 sure you... I, I kind of have a, a little different take on that too. I agree with everything you're saying, by the way. And, and, and um, you know, and I also believe that, you know, that, uh, the DOG try, does try to regulate, um, you know, a lot of this is also driven by, you know, some of the whistleblower stuff that's going on, which is great, you know, as long as it doesn't go too far on the other side. You know, it's kind of like, a, it, it's like a two-sided fence, right? Um, or two sides on the fence, however you want to say it. Um, the reality is, though, uh, I definitely think that the opioid issue is, is, is extremely uh, dramatic, and I, and, I, and I do believe that uh, pharma has tried to do things, uh, you know, with pharma, um, uh, regulatory uh, portion of that as well. Um, you know, when you look at 
physicians are they're probably the most educated people in the world and at the same time they're probably the most regulated um and you know i get a little peeved when my uh plumber pulls up in a better car than i have and and uh you know the fees that they charge and what they do but i think the reality is that you know um there's not only do you have the issue with with the um, abuse of these products and 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 offerings but because of it you can almost go too far and now we have people that are are realistically in pain and prescribers are scared to go ahead and to treat to the level that they actually may need to be treated. Um, and I think that has become a concern, but you don't hear much about that. Um, but there are patients that do suffer on both sides of that fence, as I was trying to trying to explain. And I think it's really interesting um, how we need to, you know, we need to do, we need to regulate, we need to make sure that we're doing what's right. Um, but we also need to make sure that uh, we're not short shortchanging our, our patients that uh, actually need the care that some of these products provide. Um, so hopefully I didn't go too far on the other side of that. No, that I think to, to build on that, Bob, that opens up the opportunity for people to innovate and find alternate ways to treat pain that doesn't rely oh, on opioids, right? It, is, it creates a huge opportunity too. Absolutely. Great. Uh, we have anybody else? Mm -hmm. We're over, I have already time. kept you longer time. than than we planned. Christina, you're on mute. I think on mute. No, actually, yeah. I just have a, my my. I'm tired. <laughs> my voice is tired. Um, <laughs> So for, for those of you that are still here, um, thank you so much for joining us. And I'd like to thank um, Magnus and Robert for providing um, your experience and your expertise and helping us better understand what's going on in this industry and for answering these really interesting questions. Um, you know, we talked a little bit about the classes that they teach, but um, and I, I did throw in the chat which class each of them teaches. Um, Robert teaches the biotech industry and structure class, that's management 430, and manage, and my, sorry, Magnus teaches management 445 topics in business strategy, managing healthcare and life science. So these are waiting for you, um, should you decide to come to Rady, and um, you get to sit up front in the classroom and have discussions like this every day. So if you have questions, please feel free to contact us. Um, with that, I'd like to thank again our guests, thank you for coming, and we will sign off. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, folks. Thank you very much. Very nice. Nice meeting all of you, and hope to see you soon. Bye.